Come with me to Isaiah 58 chapter. First verse says, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. So when we go on a fast, we not only pray or intercede for other people, but we allow the Lord Jesus Christ through the word of God and the Holy Spirit to show us things about ourselves that he may not be pleased with. Verse 2, he says, yet you seek me daily and you delight to know my ways. But well, here's come the word that mess it up. As, as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinances of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God, but they never enter into the fellowship. They never seek him for his righteousness. They went to them for their voice to be heard on high for what they wanted and not necessarily what he wanted. The whole second verse ain't number but window dressing. So he says in verse 3, Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our souls, and you don't even take no knowledge of that? And he told them, Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure. You exact all of your labors. I think in the Old Testament they had when you went on a fast that the servants, well, they weren't supposed to work and all that because it was a time appointed to seek the Lord. And he says, behold, you fast for strife and debate, to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is this such a fast that I have chosen? And he's going to name these things. Ain't nothing but form and fashion. A day for a man to afflict his soul. Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will thou call this a fast, an acceptable day? Of the Lord? No. When you fast, you're to seek the Lord. It's almost like, Lord, teach me how to pray. Lord, teach me what to do when I'm on a fast. What am I feeding when you go on your fast? Are you still feeding your flesh with worldly things? If you are, guess what? You will not be sustained on the fast. You'll end up coming off. It becomes, uh, I'm hungry. Boy, how much time I got? Nah. So this is all I want to say. It's just not the fast that I've chosen. This is actually intercessory prayer and prayer concerning the loss. To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burden, and let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Or you can turn around to people who are in the body of Christ. They're still yoked up with sin. And verse 7 has to do with relationships. And verse 9 has to do with behavior and character. 11 has to do with the Holy Spirit, and so forth and so on. I just thought I'd mention that. Whatever you read every day, and I take it upon myself to read that every day. Uh, well, Sister Latane was ministering on humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And see, she's been reading that and meditating on that day. And each time she gets a little bit more. And as it's given to her, it's built. She's building it into her spiritual makeup. Over the period of time, it becomes a spiritual part of her. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 chapter, you got a bad love life, keep reading that. And the love of God will start manifesting himself or through you, and you will begin to have a revelation of the fact that you are given that love to love the Lord Jesus Christ with, or the Godhead with, and then they manifest that love out from you to other people. Because your love ain't worth the hill of beans. Flake up on you, love you one second, shoot you <laughs> <laughs> the next second. Uh-huh. So the Lord is good and his mercy endure forever. Brother Kayvon ministered, I guess, about 15, about 15 minutes. Sunday, I mean, Friday, he did an excellent job. Uh-huh. Forgiveness. That's the first thing. You, ain't, you got to live a forgiving life because in the midst of people, you will always run across somebody that's going to hurt your feelings, going to make you feel bad. And if you wear your feelings on your shoulders, you will be offended. Not realizing it's the life of Christ that's in you that people are coming against. It's not you. Unless you're planting seeds like that, then what you expect if you plant seeds like that? That kind of stuff go grow up and come back and get you. And uh, not just to forgive a person, but to uh, when they do that, you turn it over to the Lord. 
You pray for them. Then you turn it over to the Lord because the Lord said, vengeance is mine and he'll get them. <laughs> and then at some point in time, when things come up, you just simply have to turn and do what? Walk away. And that takes courage. When did we leave off? Hebrews what? The 8th chapter. Oh, yes. We left off with Hebrews 8 and 7. That's what we, we was reading that. We went to Jeremiah. And we saw that the covenant was, uh, even in the Old Testament, they knew that the Old Testament, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant was of none effect. And when the word new, even when Jeremiah prophesied, and the Lord put the words in his mouth, by a new covenant he would establish. So, so we went all that. I noticed in verse 7 it says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. So they had a search, a searching was going on for the new covenant. Did you know that? In the Old Testament, a searching was going on for the new covenant. And every time Sister Candace would get up here at one point, she'd always say that. It's found in 1 Peter, 1st chapter. Look at verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and did what? Diligently search for. They can look for this. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that shall come unto you. Searching what? Or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. Wait, now we're talking about the Old Testament. Look what it says. The spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Remember that question we asked about uh, Abraham and Sister Deb asked the question? With a question, we find out that they were declared righteous because of the covenant. So you know, Cecily, I pondered on that and I pondered on that all this week. All right. I might as well bring this in right here. It says, look at verse 12. Unto whom it was revealed, to my to the prophets, the ones that were searching now, wasn't just revealed to everybody. That not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto us by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. So then in verse 11, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. That's the spirit of Christ is another name for the Holy Spirit. But remember now, you got the Old Testament. You got the New Testament. Now, these are spheres, things that happen within, all the activity taken in here. We found out that in Hebrews 13 and 20, that the blood of Jesus, now the God of peace, who brought again our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, through what? Through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So the activity took place in the New Testament of Jesus being raised from the dead. All right. So over here is the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit is the originator of the Levitical system and its interpretation as he is in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit came down here. He is the vicar of the church. He is the overseer of the church in Jesus stead. He never talks about his own self. He always reveals to us what Jesus or show us things that Jesus talk about or that he reveals things to us. All right. In the Old Testament, the conscious, conscious, your conscious, never the consciousness of sin, the Leviticus system could never get rid of consciousness of sin, but the Holy Ghost could. The Holy Ghost dealt with people in the Old Testament like he dealt with them in the New Testament concerning consciousness of sin. Consciousness of sin is only purged by a work of the Holy Spirit with the word of God. And over here with the blood of Jesus. So then you had old prophets. 
They prophesied what? According to what? What the Holy Spirit did. So then the word of God came to them, a working of the Holy Spirit, and they prophesied. Didn't it? That's in 2 Peter 1 and 21. For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they was moved on by the Holy Ghost. So see, the Holy Ghost had workings over in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. All right. The salvation which the Holy Spirit applied over here. Talk about, now we talked about the conscience. Viticus rituals couldn't do nothing about the conscience. But the Holy Spirit still worked on men's conscience in the Old Testament, just like he still does today. The salvation which the Holy Ghost applied under the Leviticus system find its source in the New Testament sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember this. So, so you, you know what's going on. Come over to 1 Corinthians. So many things that we just have etched like this can't be. No, I didn't, I didn't learn that. The Lord said he got to unlearn his people <laughs> before we can really teach them. 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Look at verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confine the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confine the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised. God has chosen, yea, and things which are nothing or not to bring to naught things that are. God can do whatever God wants to do. Israel was his chosen people. They had salvation. So then the, what I'm saying is that there's a sound, okay, we can go to, let's go to Hebrews. Well, we, we'll go to that later. But what I'm saying is the salvation over here, the Holy Spirit involved now, and the salvation over here had its source. It reached over here into the New Testament. What did David do when he was supposed to die? So their source reached over here to Jesus Christ because God, God called those things that be not as though they were. He quickened the dead. Make alive the dead. He actually was calling these over here his living children. So the salvation over here had its source in from the new covenant. New covenant had never been established yet. Now only God can do that. And if we try to understand it, understand it, it, it won't work. It's almost like you meditate on it and then things, little business start coming. Therefore, while operating under the jurisdiction of the Old Testament, God was giving salvation to Old Testament believers by virtue of that which was accomplished through the New Testament. So he declared them righteous because he was God. He declared them righteous. Since the Old Testament could not do that which the New Testament did, it was set aside. This Old Testament became antiquated. It was set aside for something better, a better testament with better promise. It was vanishing away. And Jeremiah speaks about that already taking place. I hope that kind of give you a little bit. As we go on, you'll be able to see it. When you start reading, that's what, what is in Hebrews 8 and 5? I didn't write it down there for nothing. It says, Who served unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle? See, said he, that thou make all things according to the pattern shown to thee in the mount. These were object lessons. Everything that took place in the Old Testament were object lessons pointing to what was really going to take place in the New Testament. And so the people in the Old Testament had salvation because of the covenant. And God declared his people, chosen Israel. Remember now he chose Israel to, as his people to bring forth salvation to the human race. Let's see what 9 and 23 says, Hebrews 9 and 23. Oh, okay. It was therefore necessary that the pattern of things in the heavens, look at that, the patterns, of, this goes with another, I'm going to minister on, should be purified with these. Now, the pattern of things in heaven, he's talking about the earthly tabernacle. He's not talking about heavenly things in heaven. The pattern of things in the heaven, the patterns. The Old Testament was the pattern. 
So then he's speaking about the pattern of things in the heaven should be purified with these. What, which it was. was pure, what was the things, the pattern purified by? Animal what? Animal blood. Then he goes on to say, but the heavenly things themselves. So in heaven, you got a holy place, heavenly, holy of holies. You got a mercy seat. He says, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are a figure of the truth. See, these patterns right here, which are a figure, they're not, but they're not the truth. Okay? So, I'm going to throw another one at you before we get into the message. When Jesus went to heaven, did he cleanse the heavenly utensils with his blood? John said, yes, he did. I like that, Deborah. Thank you. Go ahead on, girl. Use that nugget. Pastor taught us that Adam's sin went all the way up to heaven and that the heavenly utensils had to be clean. Why would they have to clean, cleanse the, okay. The tabernacle was in such a way that the tabernacle was a tent. The first part, there was a division between the first part. The first part was called the holy place. Don't ask me where all this is going, but it's going to come together. The second part is called the what? The holies of holies. Now, the priests could enter in here day by day, but the high priest could only enter in here how many times? Once a year. Anybody know what that time was? And the congregation said it's called the Day of Atonement. That was the only time he could come in. First of all, the righteousness, the eternal righteousness of God guarded this entrance. No flesh could go in here. And the reason why was because sinful man or sinful flesh separated man from God. So man could not go in here. The High priest had to do what? He had to offer up blood for himself before he could even go in there. Or he was going to lose his life. Huh? Oh. <laughs> Pull him out with a rope. Now, I done heard that. I ain't read that yet. Okay? I'm beginning to think. I'm telling y'all things that I hear. If I don't hear them with myself, hear them by my own ear, or the Spirit of God comments on it, I'll accept it. But I, I, you heard that they had bells around, around their skirt or whatever, and if the bell stopped ringing, they had a rope around his waist so they could pull him out. Okay. <laughs> Josephus? Oh. Oh, okay. The Lord Jesus Christ ministered to you according to the proportion of him in you. You don't have much Jesus in you, you, you just ain't going to get a whole lot. The more of Jesus you have in you, the more he'll give you. When you walk in light, what happened? More light come. Most people like to stay in the dark. They don't want to get in light. For their deeds will be reproved, which you won't. If you want to, you're talking about going in the rapture. You want everything about you exposed. Why? Because it's a lie anyway. No liars go go to the kingdom of God. Such as were some of you, but you've been washed and sanctified, and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by his spirit. Over here, you had the, come to nine, 91. The Old Testament, I'm just going to explain it to you. You can read it as we go if you want to. The Old Testament had artnesses of divine service. In other words, the laws and everything was fitted for ceremonial and ritual and symbolism. And it says it was a worldly tabernacle, nothing evil about it. It was established here on earth as in contrast to the one in heaven. So there was a, a tabernacle, a tent made. In the first part, they had the candlestick, the table, the showbread, and it's called a holy place. And then after the second veil, the first veil was the one in front of it. That was the first entrance into the holy place. The second veil 
of the tabernacle is called the most holy place. It had a golden censer in it. It had the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Ark of the Covenant was a golden pot that had manna, had Aaron's rod that budded, and it had the tables of the Ten Commandments. Notice it had the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a chest or a box. Okay? Over that, it had the cherubims, the angels. Oh, well, yeah, it had the cherubims over it. What the high priest would do would be come in there on the Day of Atonement. He would take the blood of an animal and he would put it right here in the mercy. This is where the mercy seat was. He put it on the top covering of the ark. That's where the mercy seat was. Inside the mercy seat now was the covenant. So what he did, he applied the blood between, he represented the people now and his own self. He applied the blood on the mercy seat. And it covered their sin because, see, judgment from the covenant could have come out and went on the people. But the blood kept it. See? So now Jesus comes on the scene. He sheds his blood where? On Calvary's cross. And his blood dripped where? In the earth. The word of God says, in verse uh, 9, 9 and 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figure of the true, but into heaven itself. But notice what it says. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. That's what it said, didn't it? All right. By virtue of the fact that Jesus entered into heaven, having accomplished salvation by sacrifice of himself. See, when Jesus sacrificed his own self, his blood was shed. Why would he have to go apply blood in heaven when he himself is the eternal redemption? When he showed up in heaven, bloodless, humanity, bloodless, sinless, no blood in it, but he fully glorified. Now, why would he have to? He walks in there. That's him. He's the eternal bloodshedder. Why would he have to take his blood and put it on something? Huh? Somebody give me an answer. Bloodless, glorified human body is the eternal testimony of the fact that he paid for sin. No, he wouldn't have to spare no blood. He, he's the walking bloodshed. Oh, okay, let's let's go, we hold. Okay, let's go to Hebrews. Uh, boy, the book of Hebrews is just too good. But I'm I'm telling you, he, he wait. This is how it happened. He went to heaven. He went into the holy of holies. He applied his blood. See, this is this is a figure of what to come. But he didn't necessarily have to take real blood up there because he had shed it. He had paid the price. You're looking at, you're looking at the blood that of my cross. You're looking at the blood that paid the sin. It was him. So he didn't have to put no blood on nothing. But by faith, this is what he did, but not no actual blood. If blood got God in it and it got his life in it, why would he have to take it up there? And they're all up there. That's when I said, don't, you, you, I'm not coming against what pastor said. I'm going up on another side of the mountain. How about that? I don't want to bust nobody's little bubbles in here. <laughs> but you, you want what the word of God is saying. I'm listening to things from other ministers, Brother Copeland, other viable ministries. And I'm saying, then I just said, well, they're going up another side of the mountain for another group of people. So I'm just saying, there was no need for Jesus to do that. This was just an example to show you, this is a type to show you what took place. Yes, his blood, he went into the heavenly holies of holies and applied his blood. Well, you just said he applied his blood. This is a type, they let you see down here what the Old Testament did to what is synonymous to what would be done if in the, what, high courts of justice, the heavenly high courts of justice, where Jesus would have to come into 
and make himself known as to what he did, satisfied the law and the righteousness of God. All right, floor is open if anybody want to say something. When his blood went on the okay, when he went to the cross and all his blood shed it to the ground. Mm -hmm. All his blood came out of him. That's what you're saying? He poured out his blood unto death. That's what the word said. Take no, blood no see, see, our mind is set like he going to take real blood. See, your, your mind paints your picture of him taking real blood. But what, where your faith come in at? You know what I mean? When I, when I said, Sister Ruth, I plead the blood of Jesus on you. I don't see no blood. Like, like verse 9 and 12 says, by, neither by the blood of goats and cats, but by his own blood he entered. Once it doesn't mean that he didn't have to go in there with blood, but by his blood he shed on the cross, and that blood, by his blood, he entered in. There you go. He entered into the Holy Okay. This, this is part I was going to get to. The blood not only opened the grave, but it also did what? Open heaven. Notice in... Uh, 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 until he did that. Notice in Hebrews 9... And that's what Sister Ruth was read, Hebrews 9 and 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the Holy of Holies, having obtained eternal redemption for us. He didn't have to carry no blood up there. His blood caused him to go in heaven. Just like his blood caused the grave to open. When you get ready to minister something, you get ready to say something somebody else has have said, you ask the Holy Spirit to make it real to you. So you, when you get ready to, because see, these last days is getting ready, they change it. Because see, everybody think they know about the word of God. Everybody just think, I know that. Okay. Now, if you tell me what the word says, that's fine and good. If you say the word says this, once you kind of, de- like me, I'm ministering to you, that means I have to bring another aspect in. You better make sure that aspect is founded uh, on the foundation that Jesus is built on. Okay? The Old Testament tabernacle, God manifested his presence inside the veil. This is where God's presence was. No man could come there. So when Jesus did what he did, he gave us access to the Father by the Spirit of God. This is the reason why Jesus Christ shed his blood. You don't need no mediator but Jesus Christ. I, Sister Ruth, I need you to pray for me and go to the Father for me. I be when somebody say, oh, Sister, I want you to pray for me. I be want to say so bad, God, the blood of Jesus was shed for you. <laughs> you can go to God for your own self. I ain't the mediator. Jesus is the mediator. But now, like Sister Candace said, if y'all would come in agreement with me. But everybody can, you can come boldly to the throne of grace. As a matter of fact, the blood of Jesus established the throne of grace. Come over here to Hebrews 4 and 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest, talking about Jesus Christ, that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let's hold fast our profession. And what is that? What is your profession of faith? And the congregation said, what do y'all profess? That Susan Ruth has got it right. She professed that Jesus is Lord. What you profess? Uh-huh. Oh. Jesus is Lord and he has got to be something you professing, something you're saying all the time about Jesus, what he is to you. And see, y'all say, I trust Jesus. Every time you say, I trust, I just trust the Lord, I trust the Lord. You know what that means? I'm going to shock y'all when y'all talking about y'all trust the Lord. Mm-hmm. I trust the Lord according to his word. I know he going to do this. That means you trust the Lord for something you done asked him for. And he's going to bring it to pass. When you say, I'm trusting the Lord, that means you are trusting him to conform you to his image. Don't care what you go through. All Jesus looking at is conforming you to his image. When you say, I trust your Lord, that get him corporate privilege to do whatever he wants with you because you trust in him. 
<laughs> you got your eye fixed on what thing you trusting him for. And the only thing he's thinking about is making you just like him. So be careful when you say, Lord, I trust you. I trust you in this situation, Lord. I trust you in that situation. Yeah, you trust in him, but he using that situation to do what? Make you like him. You might have to go through that book five or six times. So I'm telling you this ahead of time. If you say you're going to trust him. <laughs> All right, Lord, I'm trusting you. That means you're going to conform me to your image. And you're going to use this fiery trial. And guess what, Lord? Come on, let's go. <laughs> Because you said you're going to deliver me out of it. All right. No power of man could remove that veil. So we went to the high priest could only enter in. All of this is written in the book of Hebrews, and this is our reading. But see, Jesus' blood, first of all, by him being son of man, he had human blood. But that human blood was what? Sinless. And his personage was that of his very essence was that of deity. So now his blood, remember he had two natures, the son of man and son of God, seed of David, and God prepared him a body, which was seed of David. And he, as God, stepped down from his glory, so then he still had the essence of deity. So then this blood was applied on the mercy seat in the heavenly holies of holy. It was a payment for man's sin. See, the scriptures always give you words to build an image. If I can get them to see what was done as a type, they can see how it is applied spiritually. But Jesus didn't go into nowhere and apply his blood. It's the fact that he shed his blood on Calvary's cross that gave him entrance into heaven. Mm -hmm. So we don't, you don't see him you know, putting his blood. Now, if somebody tell you that, don't jump all on them. Somebody say he put his, yeah, Jesus went in heaven, put his blood on the mercy seat, and Jesus uh, did this with his blood when he was in heaven. Oh, that's fine. Ain't nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Why? It takes a, only the Spirit of God can unlearn you. He wants you to learn him. So his blood even in the high courts of heaven, would be accepted as a sacrifice or a payment for human sin. All right? But all, everything takes place. Remember now, Jesus was slain when? The Lamb of God was slain before the foundation of the world. Well, what they mean slain? He was separated from the Father, and everything that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had was put in Lamb. I'll tell you one thing, Pastor teaching was... Like you said, chunks, big chunks. All right? That happened spiritually. If it had not taken place spiritually, he could not have died on the cross. See, I always tell you, including what's going on in your life. Quit looking at the symptoms. Quit looking at the symptoms of things. Trace that symptom back to what is causing this. You're going to be putting band-aids on the symptoms forever. You're going to be putting band-aid on that sinful act forever. Go find out what is the cause of this. And don't blame it on nobody else. Let it point back to you. Don't blame it on nobody else. Then the Lord can work with you because even when it comes to healing, when something is wrong with your body, trace it back. What is the cause of it? It could be you praying, somebody praying for your healing over and over again, and you over and over again, and you getting sick. All over and over again, something is wrong. It's not that the word ain't working. So this is with everything on your job. When things ain't going right, something happens, trace it back to the cause. And this is going to find out it's going to either be for what? The word's sake or you done sold some bad seed <laughs> and they coming up. <laughs> All right. Man, we just thank you, Lord. All right. When Jesus, as our high priest, when he went into the Holy of heaven, he also was representing us. Come with me to John 17 chapter. When Jesus went into the Holy of Holies, in the holies of holies now, remember now, this is where the presence of God was. So in other words, when Jesus went into the presence of God, he asked for himself and for the sinful children of Adam an entrance into the presence of the Holy One. Look at John 17, 24. This is 
is his request. He says, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. See, that's his request he's making to the Father. In the midst of, in John 17, you got to remember now, the Lord Jesus Christ is stepping in and out of eternity. Ain't that right, Sister Ruth? <laughs> he's with his uh, apostles, but he's stepping over in eternity, taking care of heavenly business and coming back, having a meet, taking care of heavenly business, because the Father is in on it too. He asked that heaven may be open for each one, even the greatest sinner who believes in him. His request is granted. But how is that? It's granted through the blood. You can't separate the blood from nothing. You start reading the Bible in the light of the light, the fact that Jesus Christ shed his blood, you can't separate the blood of Jesus from the almightiness of God. Now you read the Bible, you're reading it in the, in the, in the how can Latanya humble herself if God had if Jesus had not shed his blood? She couldn't. Why? He humbled himself even to the obedience of death. What death? Death on the cross. Shed his blood. You just can't get away from the blood. Don't care how you try. Powerful blood. So it was through the blood. He entered through his own blood. The blood of Jesus had opened heaven. Let's go quickly to uh, Hebrews. Hebrews 13. It ought to fall over. <laughs> Hebrews 13 chapter, look at verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep. But see, he brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, what? Through the blood of the covenant. All right. Now look at Hebrews 9 and 12. But by his own blood... He entered in once into the holy place. The, that's the heavenly holies of holies. Because it says in verse 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, but he entered into the one in heaven, having obtained redemption for us. When Jesus Christ paid the penalty and the payment for our sins, first of all, that knocked out spiritual death. You got to remember now, Jesus was Jesus held captive by death. Was Jesus on this earth realm, walking this earth, was, was he under the jurisdiction of the devil? Yeah, he was under it. Jesus was under the jurisdiction of the devil. As soon as he took, yeah, as soon as he took on flesh, bone, man, body, the devil had rushed over him. How could he deliver us out of it if he had not? Come over here to Hebrews. Hebrews, the second chapter. For as much then, 14 verse, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, human beings, he also himself, likewise, he took hold with us together of the same through his incarnation, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So you need not say, girl, guess what the devil doing? You say that, he working in your life. He ain't working nobody else but yours. You are proclaiming the enemy and his work. You have no business saying what the devil has done. I, t I told my mama yesterday, I said, uh, uh oh, I'm going to tell on myself. I ain't going to tell. <laughs> Forget about that. I made, I made a statement by hell. Then I got in the car and got ready to drive away. I came back and rung on the door and I said, let's, let's erase that. I come out, I, why had it said hell when I could have said heavenly? Because as soon as I got in the car, I said, well, what you say hell for? You could have used heavenly. So I got out the car, <laughs> ran in front of the doorbell, and said, my dear, <laughs> instead of saying the hell I will, the heavenly I will. That's what I said, did The hell I will. The, oh, she says, whenever I said the heck, heck, I'm saying, you know, what the heck? I don't be saying what the hell. I be actually meaning what the heck. It's like, I don't care. So I, it's not, I'm not. When, you, when I say things, I'm not transferring hell for one thing and something else. That's what she thinks. And I don't correct her because she thinks that. <laughs> That's her business. But I know myself when I say, oh, what the heck? I'm not saying, oh, what the hell? Because that's not what? In me. What, what we, oh, yeah. So then he made death 
He was under death. He partook with us. So that put him, he was made in the likeness of sin for man, but without sin. So that put him under the jurisdiction of Satan. And what he did when he was raised, we was raised from it and taken out from the devil. So he took care of death. He took care of the devil. He took care of sin. So he opened the grave. Now he made a way through his blood. He opened heaven, giving us access to the Father. And next time we'll look at how powerful the blood is in the human heart. Amen. Any questions? So when, um, when the Father prepared him a body, prepared the Lord Jesus a body, and he, he came through the womb, womb of a woman, that subjected him, uh, he, was, he, was, uh, he was subjected to the, uh, to the devil in that sense, because he said, the devil come to me and he find nothing in me. So, so um, even though he was, he, was, he was subjected to him in the physical, but at the same time, the Lord, the Lord had, had dominion over him because he didn't have anything in him. Okay. In the incarnation, remember now, the incarnation was for the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ to be an example to show us how we could walk before God. In the incarnation, even though the devil, the devil couldn't find nothing in him because he already said he had no sin in him, so the devil ain't had nothing to find in him. But yet, he was under the devil's jurisdiction because he came down as what? What did he come down as, Brother Hesse? Son of man. Son of man. He was man. So the devil had jurisdiction over him, even though he was God. But he shed off his glory, and he came down here to identify with us so that when he get over here in heaven, we can identify with him. Right. Mm-hmm. See that? I thank the Lord for the congregation. Everybody here from Friday, the way y'all minister, everybody here, y'all can minister. Amen? And all us together, we'll get to the truth of everything. Like Pastor said, you don't need to have nobody in here. You got Brother Hester, Sister Ruth, and then he said, the whole congregation knows how to minister, know the word of God. And so what we want to do, we're going to follow Jesus' design for us. We're going to follow his purpose for us. Where you are is your field. Work it. Whatever you have to do, Jesus will back you up in it. You promote him. You, I ain't talking about belligerent. I'm talking about being a belligerent Christian. I'm talking about operating in love, joy, and peace. That has to do with your experience. Long-suffering, goodness, and gentleness has to do with your conduct. Faithfulness, meekness, and temperance has to do with your, and the congregation said, character. So see, the fruit of the Spirit ain't just the fruit of the Spirit. It's for specific things. Amen? All right. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. Yes, indeed. And no, it did not go no way that I thought, but the Lord is good and his mercy endured forever.